Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Kevin, and in this week's video, we're going to take a look at a non-technical topic for a change. Specifically, we're going to consider a collection of career strategies. I thought with the unemployment numbers being what we've been seeing lately, I thought this might be really timely for many of our viewers. And this video is an excerpt from our three-day search summit that we did last week. If you missed it, we had a total of six sessions spreading over three days. We had Anthony Sequeira, we had Charles Judd and myself presenting. And you're going to be watching my session on career strategies. And these strategies include career goal setting, landing your dream job, and for experience, here's how to start your own IT consulting company. And we'll talk about time management. And if you enjoy this video, please do me a favor, click the like button down below, and also subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now, let's jump into this replay of a session I did on career strategies. Great to have everybody with us here, and we're going to start talking about some career goals. And when we think about goal setting, I personally that that terminology doesn't really fire me up. I don't get excited about quote unquote goal setting, but if I love Zig Ziglar's uh, comment, uh, Zig Ziglar a long time ago said, uh, uh, "You can't hit a, uh, you cannot hit a target that you don't even have." Think about that one. Do, do you have a target? Do you have somewhere you're going? Are you just showing up and doing whatever the boss tells you to do each day, or do you have a target for your career, for your health, for your relationships, for your spirituality in all areas of life? Do you have a target? And that's what uh, goal setting is about, but I prefer to call it destiny design because when we're doing destiny, de uh, when we're setting goals, that's really what we're doing. We're designing our destiny. And I want to give you some tips. And again, I'm taking some of this, uh, some of this from uh, Tony Robbins, some of this from Brendan Bouchard, some of this from Zig Ziglar. I've gone through all of their different goal setting workshops multiple times, and uh, I've, I've had all their planners, and I just kind of picked out what works for me. So for me, and, and I'll tell you, this first one was uh, was something I got from Tony Robbins. Uh, when you're setting a, uh, when you have a goal setting session, the recommendation is that you don't set too many goals. Otherwise, it's overwhelming. You're not going to be able to put enough focus on any one goal. Things are going to be left behind. But if you only have two or three goals, that's really not enough to really juice you to go uh, to really go for it. So if you have about five to nine goals, that seems to be the sweet spot in different areas in different areas of your life. For example, you might have a goal for your relationships, again, for your finances and for your career. But if you can have about five to nine different goals for a year's period, and you don't have to set them at New Year's, you can do that anytime. You could do that after class today. And to do that, you say, okay, do I just like write them down? No, you're going to have a goal setting workshop. And during that time, what I would do is I would put on like uh, some uh, calming spot or maybe not calming, but some instrumental uh, playlist on Spotify, just some good background music to help keep all the distractions away. And you know, make sure you're just make sure your phone's turned off or on silent mode or something. And I want you to just sit there and I want you to kind of dream. Dream about, uh, just like a kid would dream about when I grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut. That was one of mine when I was growing up. But I want you to dream about... Where do I want to be in my career? We'll focus on career in this discussion. Where do I want to be in my career in a year, in five years? Do I want to be in management? Do I want to have a CCIE? Uh, do I want to maybe change careers? Maybe I'm not in IT right now and I would like to get into IT. Just sit and think about that for a time. And when you're coming up, oh, push, push the wrong button there. And when you're coming up with these different goals, realize that there are different kinds that you should be setting. You can have an activity goal an accomplishment goal, or an aspirational goal. Let me give you some examples of those. The activity goal, that's something that you're going to do, uh, and it's measurable. For example, if you're studying for, uh, if you're studying for your NP, you're studying uh, a NARSI, or you're studying Encore, an activity goal might be, I'm going to study OSPF for one hour today. That's an activity. Uh, more so than an accomplishment. An accomplishment might be, yes, I earned my CCNP enterprise. That's an accomplishment that's measurable. But sometimes you, you cannot say, I'm going to learn everything there is to know about OSPF today. 
No, because there's a lot to know about OSPF, but you can you can still feel successful because you've you've accomplished a measurable activity. You studied OSPF or you labbed up something in OSPF. So think about the difference as you're setting those goals. Make some of them activity, which you can check those off. Yes, I did that activity. Some of them, those activities led to this accomplishment. But an aspirational goal is... Who do you want to be? Who do you, who do you aspire to be? I always, I, a lot of times I joke and say, yeah, that's who I want to be when I grow up. But literally, an aspirational goal is the kind of person you want to show up as. I don't want to just be a CCIE that makes X amount of uh, dollars per year. I want to, I want to be a good person. I, I want to... Uh, I want to enjoy my life. I want to have humor. I want to have connections with my family. So an aspirational goal is not just about what you accomplish where you're just always driving hardcore, bam, bam, bam. No, it's it's who you want to be as a person. And I want you to think about that as you're setting your goals. And for please write them down. So many people just do this as a mental exercise. And there is so much, uh, so much research behind this that shows that you dramatically increase your odds of achieving those goals if you, if you do nothing more than write them down. If you just write them down on New Year's, don't look at them again until next New Year's, you've already dramatically increased your odds of achieving those goals And if you had done nothing and didn't write them down. So it's super, super critical to write down those different goals. And... You've got to know why you're doing it. You don't want to just have a goal because that's probably a good career move. Maybe I should do that. For example, um, I'll give you a couple of examples of when I did and did not have a compelling why. Uh, why is your underlying motivation? Why is it important that you achieve this goal? I remember um, my, my uh, bachelor's, uh, bachelor's degree, by the way, is in electrical engineering. And uh, I had a job. I was working as a, as a network manager at a university. And I thought, you know, I think it would be a good career move if I got my MBA on top of that, my master's of business administration. So I started taking night classes. And I did it not because I was really fired up about it. I did it because I thought it might be a good career move, but it wasn't something that I was really driven to do. Now, maybe that was still a good move, but I had not come up with a compelling why am I going to do this? I didn't have something that's really going to inspire me when it gets hard. And whatever it is, it's going to get hard. What do you have to push you through those hard times? So that was a time where, you know what, after I, I think I had maybe a couple of years in toward my MBA, I was getting not, not that far away from finishing it. And I, I stopped. I, I quit because uh, here's what uh, here's what I thought. I was working with Cisco gear that was kind of new to me. This is back like in the, around 1990. I'd been working with the Cisco gear and I was loving that. And I was taking all these MBA classes at night that weren't really inspiring me. And uh, I remember watching uh, watching a movie. It's an old uh, movie called The Color of Money with, uh, with Paul Newman and Tom Cruise. I don't know if you've seen that one, but it's where Paul Newman is this uh, pool shark and he's called uh, Fast Eddie Felson. And uh, I think Tom Cruise's character is called, uh, it might be Vinny. I might be wrong on that, but he's kind of giving advice. He's kind of mentoring the, the very young Tom Cruise character. And he's saying that, he said, um, if you can be the best at something, uh, uh, if you have an area of excellence, he said, then the money can come fairly easily. And I thought, you know what? I really love working with this Cisco stuff. I don't really love taking accounting classes as part of my MBA program. And if I become really, really good at Cisco, yeah, if I just focus on something I'm passionate about, yeah, I'm not going to be the best in the world at it, but I can I can get up there in the top 1% or 2%. That's not that hard to do if you really focus on it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to step away from the MBA and I'm going to go all in with the Cisco stuff. And a few years later, I started building certifications and it just grew and grew because I had a compelling uh, compelling why because I loved it. Uh, more recent example, a compelling why. Um, for years, weight loss, to, just to be very transparent with you, that's always been a, that's always been a struggle for me. And I've always and I've tried diet after diet. I've started dozens of times, but usually I lack the motivation and a couple of weeks in, I'd make exceptions and I, I would stop. Because even though, yeah, I wanted to be thinner, I would feel better. I would sometimes I would even write down my whys. Here's why I want to do this. 
but I never really had that that really compelling why. But uh, since the middle of February this year until now, I've lost about 25 pounds in about a month and a half because I finally got a compelling why. And that is my, my daughter is getting married this summer and I'm going to be the father of the bride. I'm going to be in the tux and we're going to take all the wedding pictures. And I, you know, I want to look good for that event. So for whatever reason, nothing else worked until I got a really compelling why. So I want you to think about why you want whatever, whatever goal it is you're, you're writing down. And sometimes you write down a goal and it seems overwhelming. Like if you say, I'm going to go get my, uh, for some of you, maybe getting your CCNA is an overwhelming goal because you haven't worked that much with Cisco or getting your CCIE. But what Brenda, uh, this is something I got from Brendan Bouchard. He says, whatever this big goal is that you're going after, don't get overwhelmed by it. Chunk it down into five basic moves because anything we're going to go after can be quantified into like five different major chunks, five major moves. Uh, the CCNA example. Let's use that. Let's say I decide to get my CCNA. Well, maybe my first move is decide, where am I going to get my training? Am I going to get it from a book? Am I that kind of learner? Am I going to get it from somebody like Kevin that teaches the video course? Where are you going to get your training? Uh, number two, you want to schedule out your study time. You don't want to just say, yeah, I'm going to study CCNA. Now, I want you to block out maybe an hour every workday, maybe three hours on Saturday. That would get you eight hours a week to do study. So you want to schedule what you're doing. Then maybe your, your third move is finding some way of getting hands-on experience. Get those home labs. Use packet trace or something like that. So getting hands-on experience, that might be that third move. Your fourth move might be going through some practice exams just to make sure you're ready for the real thing. And then the fifth move might be like scheduling and actually taking that exam. So you took that CCNA goal and you chunked it down into five basic moves. You can do that with the largest of goals. Now, some of those moves might be really large depending on the size of your goal, but for me, it helps it not be overwhelming. And whatever your goals are, you've come up with these nine goals, you're passionate about them, you've got your why, you've broken, down, uh, you've broken them down into your different moves, schedule it, whatever it is. Don't, don't leave the side of a goal without taking some kind of an action, Tony Robbins says. And by scheduling it, I mean actually put on your calendar when you're going to be doing these things. I don't have it in front of me right now, but I wish you could see the calendar I had when I was going after my last CCIE. I would literally have, okay, I'm going to study here, here, and the CCIE lab runs for about eight hours. So on some days, I would block out eight hours where I would just do a mock lab and on my home lab all day long. What gets scheduled gets done. If you don't schedule it, the temptation is to drift. Have you ever drifted away from something that you were once passionate about? That initial inspiration, that initial fire, it wanes. It wanes. So keep keep it on a schedule. And if you just write it down, I said it was better to write it down and do nothing than not to write it down at all. But you know what's really going to going to turbocharge that? Reviewing it regularly. I try to get in the habit. And I'm not, when I say I do all these things, please understand I'm not perfect at it. There are some weeks that go by that I don't do everything that I'm going to tell you that, uh, that I'm doing. But I, I like to review my yearly goals on, uh, I have kind of a, a review time on Sundays. That's kind of when I do it. I look over my goals and see, am I on track? Do I need to, do I need to make any adjustments? So for me, instead of doing like a smart goal setting workshop where you're specific, measurable, actionable, uh, let's see, realistic and time bound, I like to do something like this instead. Again, experiment, do what's right for you. And I want to give you some solid examples. It's one thing just to have a cognitive understanding that, yes, setting goals would probably be a good thing. But um, just to make the point, and again, please don't take this as I'm, th this is not coming from a place of boasting like I've done this and this and this. It comes from a place of this stuff works. And what I did, uh, I actually went back to some of my old journals, some of my own, uh, my old time management systems that go way back into the 90s. And I started looking through some of my old goals. And it was funny to see how low I had set the bar for some things and how some things, yeah, that's come true, that's come true. And I, I picked out some goals that I had actually written down. 
And uh, so these are exact dates that I took out of some of my, my old time management journals. But on May the 24th, way back in 2002, I, I always enjoyed writing. They told me back in high school that I kind of had a knack for writing, but I never really did anything with it. And I thought, okay, I'm loving this Cisco stuff. I'm getting my certifications. And uh, I remember when Cisco Press started first putting out books, my goal was to buy every Cisco Press book and have the entire library. Well, they have so many books now, I probably wouldn't be able to afford that. But I had the goal of, it would be so cool if I could write a book on Cisco Technologies. And my first book, in fact, um, yeah, I think I showed it to you the other day. I think uh, around, I started working on this in the year 2000. It was published in, uh, uh, in, uh, in t uh, well, no, it was, uh, this was, uh, this was 2001. Uh, this book came out. And when I say Cis Cisco Technologies, uh, that specifically was, I wanted to write a book for Cisco Press. I had done this book for Cybex, but I really wanted to write, write a book for Cisco Press. That's the goal I set in 2002. And then... My first Cisco Press book was released in February of 2004. And a lot of people say, all right, how do you get into that? How do you, uh, how do you get a publisher to, to accept, your, uh, accept your proposal? Because a lot of people are writing into those publishers saying, yeah, I want to, uh, I want to write a book or something. And you know what? We'll, uh, we'll oftentimes just get frustrated because we don't hear anything back or we'll get rejection letters back. Here's what's worked best for me if anybody has a similar goal. Uh, I partnered with somebody that was already an author. Uh, like when I, when I did that book, I partnered with Todd Lamley. He let me be a co-author. And then when I wanted to get into Cisco Press because I was like leaving messages and nobody was getting back with me. But uh, remember Anthony from uh, two days ago, Anthony Sequera, he was already writing some stuff for Cisco Press and he he kind of let me get in the door there. He let me co-author a book with him. And we later co-authored a different book. And once I had done enough co-authoring, they Cisco Press started letting me write my own books. But look at that. In less than a year, I want to write a book for Cisco Press. In less than a year, that book was published. Would that have happened if I had not written it down? I honestly don't think so. If I had not gone through the goal setting process and written it down and reviewed it and took action, I don't think it would have happened. Another example, June 21st, 2005, I said, I want to get my CCI voice certification. And my why was not strong enough right then, but I still wanted it. And it took me a long time to do it. Uh, it was actually, uh, it was actually in 2012 before I actually earned my CCA voice certification. But, um, uh, it wasn't that I was working on it that entire time, but that's when I first wrote it down. And it was kind of in the back of my mind. And then, I guess it was maybe about a year before I actually got the uh, the voice certification. I just had this incredible desire for it. Uh, it wasn't that I thought this would be a great career move. I'll be able to make a lot more money if I get the CCA voice certification. I just really wanted it. I, I, re I remember having the conversation with my wife. Uh, she was uh, very clearly, she was out on a port swing. And I come out and I said, because she knew how much I went through when I got my first CCA, and it's a lot of work. You need to have your family's support on that. I went out there and I told her, you know, I really want to go for the CCA voice. Don't have a reason, just I just I just really want to do this. And she was totally supportive of that. And it was a lot of work. It took a, I tried to keep loose count. It took me about 1,600 hours of study in order to get that certification. It took me two attempts to get that certification, but I just really wanted it. And when you have a desire for something, now this is a personal opinion. Uh, I know we've got all sorts of, of traditions that are joining us here from all over the world. Personally, personally, I'm a Christian. And when I have a strong desire for something, if you look at the word desire, it breaks down in Latin to de sire, like, like a sire. You hear about a horse having a father, a sire. De sire means of the father. So if I have a burning desire for something, my personal belief, I think it came from somewhere, and I think I'll be equipped to reach whatever that strong desire is, and I reached that one in 2012. Then, 2000, uh, 2009, I'd, I'd written some sort of tangential Cisco Press books. I wrote one on like uh, design, and I wrote a, a getting started with voice over IP or something like that, but I wanted to write something one of the real core, one of the flagship Cisco Press books, like on uh, CCMP. And I got to write, uh, I got to write a CCMP book on uh, T-Shoot, 
uh, the uh, the following year. And after that, I went on to write like uh, the route book and did quite a bit for Cisco Press, doing videos and books for them. And one more as an example, uh, back in 2014, I set a goal to, to leave my full-time job. I was working with a Cisco learning partner, m making really good money. And I decided to walk away because I wanted to start my own uh, company. And I made that decision back in on June the 15th, 2014. And we came up with the plan. We worked through this like, okay, I'm going to have this done, but this time I'm going to give my notice on this date. We're going to have all these things in place. I'm going to have my company uh, already set up legally. And it happened September 26th of that year. Uh, so now we're we're approaching our sixth year anniversary of doing that. Again, none of that to none of that to, to boast. Please hear me on that. But this is evidence. These are actual goals that I had written down in my journals over the years, and they happened. Do I think all these things would happen without going through that process? I really don't. So I want you to take advantage of that. It's not a heavy lift to set aside some goal setting time to review it weekly. To, to keep all those guidelines in mind that I gave you. And we talked about having an aspirational goal, like what kind of person do you want to be? Uh, you want to be like this happy, healthy family person that's going to be uh, leading a group of IT engineers, for example. Maybe you want to be in management. So I want you to stop and think for a second. This is going to be a real-time in-class exercise. I really want you to do this. We're going to, I'm going to give you about a minute. I'll put on about a minute's worth of music, and I want you to think to yourself, uh, really, really do some, really do some deep work here over this minute, and think: Where do you want to be in five years, and who do you want to be in five years? Not just be a CCA, but you want to be happily living in your dream home, and you're going to have this great family, and you're going to be doing maybe this in the IT career, uh, in your IT career, if that's what you want to do. But can you do this for me? I'm going to give you about a minute's worth of music. And in one sentence, if you can, because we've got a lot of people joining us, in one sentence, if you can, can you just type into the chat interface, where do you want to be and who do you want to be in five years' time from now as it relates as it relates to uh, your long-term career goal? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put on about one minute's worth of music. When you think about it, chat it into the interface, and we'll come back and, and maybe take a sampling from what some of our students are saying. We had some great responses coming in. I'm, I get inspired just reading what some of uh, some of you guys and gals are saying. Like, uh, yeah, we've had people wanting to earn certain certifications, but also saying, yeah, I want to be. I, I love the one somebody said they wanted to be mentoring a group of IT engineers. So you're helping you're helping the next generation. So I think that is super inspiring. Somebody wanted to be on the beach in Hawaii while running uh, while running their own business, and. That reminded me of kind of a kind of a funny story because I'm always for for years I've been reading these books like like the Tony Robbins and the Zig Ziglar and how to advance your career. I've been reading all that kind of stuff literally for decades, and I've got like 
Dax, if you've ever seen the the, the funny Tal uh, Lopez uh, infomercial when you're watching a YouTube video, you know, the here in my garage thing, he's got the big library of books on his wall. Uh, well, I've, I've got pretty much that many books. And I remember one time, uh, my wife and I, we were on vacation down at, uh, uh, at let's see, it was uh, down at Atlantis. In on Paradise Island in the Bahamas, and we're staying uh, staying there at the at the reef and or around the pool, and we're sitting out there, and I'm reading one of those books, and I remember she made the comment. She said, "You know, if uh, if you would stop reading all those books on how to get rich, we we would be okay financially." And I said, "Look around. I mean, we were we were kind of in paradise right that." And she thought that was hilarious. Uh, we were just kidding with each other, but yeah. You can be on a beach in Hawaii and be super successful in your career. Just some super inspiring things coming on. Yeah, somebody's concerned about having a happy wife. That's right. Happy wife, happy life for sure. Uh, because yeah, you don't want to alienate your family when you do this. And you got to make sure that they're they're going to support whatever you do. So I hope this, is, uh, this has given you a the incentive to maybe set some time aside and do some calendaring and actually write down like a full set of five to nine goals that you'd like to accomplish over the next year. I hope that's really helped you with that. And one thing that that I cannot overemphasize is that you've got to be consistent with this. If you just write it down and stop, that's better than not writing it down, but it helps so much if you will do a weekly check-in. So here's what I personally do. I, I like to review the previous week and I'll think through the different areas of my life and literally grade myself. In fact, uh, I, uh, here's, uh, I've used a bunch of different planners. The one I'm using now, it's, um, it's from Brend Brendan Burchard and it's called the High Performance Planner. There's not really much of a design on the front. It's kind of embossed. I don't think you can see that, but it's the High Performance Planner from Brendan Burchard and it has this little weekly review that I go through. And here it's got different life areas and you get to score yourself uh, like on a, on a scale of one to five or, or one to 10. And you see how you're doing this week. And I, I like to go back and compare it to how I was doing last week. And in all these different life areas, for example, they've got uh, health, uh, emotional, uh, love, family, friends, mission, experience, spirit, finances, learning. Rate yourself, uh, I like to rate myself in all those areas and there's a place to write down, what's one thing I could do this coming week to make progress in that area, especially if I had a low score that week. So I love that I can, uh, I love that I can go back and, and do that. And yeah, that's what I was saying a moment ago, identify how you can improve in that area. And when I'm doing my weekly organization, I like to spend Sunday, or I'll take about an hour sometimes on Sunday afternoon and I will just think about, all right, what's all the stuff that I got to do this week? Uh, and sometimes I've already thought of things the week before that I need to do the previous week and I dump it in an inbox. Now there's all kinds of app, uh, apps out there. Let's see, where's my phone? There's all kinds of apps out there that can help you do this. There's all kinds of written journals that can help you do this. Now, I've tried a ton of different... I always think my life is going to be so much better if I find the right app. <laughs> it really doesn't matter that much which app you use, but the one I always keep coming back to is the Things app. Uh, it's uh, uh, Here I've got it on my iPhone. I've got it on my uh, Mac computers as well. It's on my iPad. And uh, this is... I consult my Things app I cannot tell you how many times a day. And there's one area called the inbox, and it's all cleared out right now. But uh, I will sit there on Sunday afternoon, and I'll just think, i got to do this, got to do this, 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 this. Because getting it out of your head gives, for me, it just gives me so much relief that I'm not processing it and worrying about it. It's captured. I don't have... I know I'm not going to forget it. In fact, uh, I was about to get in the shower recently and I thought about something I wanted to share in this CERT Summit. And I thought, oh, I don't want to forget that. So I'm, I'm running back through the house and, <laughs> and I'm writing down on my uh, notebook, okay, I want to share this just so I don't forget it because I was in the, sh uh, in the shower. The, it wasn't really convenient to, to use the Things app. But uh, I love to dump in what I'm going to do every week. And then... This is something I got from Tony Robbins. Let's say I've got a list of 15 things I need to do this coming week. Tony Robbins suggests that we assign a role to these different items. Now, a role is a role that you play in your life. For example, 
I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a business owner. I'm an instructor. I'm all these different things. I've got like 10 different roles. And when I come up with something I want to do that week to really juice it up for me and, and make me want to do it, I assign it to a role. And Tony Robbins says, don't just come up with a role saying that you're a father, uh, in my case. Make it, a, make it a juicy role that makes you really want to spend time there. So if you were to look at my Things app, I've got all these tags where when I set, a, when I set something I want to do, I assign a tag to it. So if I'm going to do something for, my, for one of my daughters, I'm not just the, my role is not just a dad. My role is a dad of destiny because that makes me realize that I'm having an impact on their future. And uh, well, I'll tell you one, a funny one from today. If you look at my, uh, if you were to look at my uh, my schedule for today, let me see here. Yeah, there's one where uh, this is the day where I bring in garbage cans from the, from the curb. But uh, you know what? Bringing garbage cans is not just like a household maintenance chore. It's It falls under the category of creator of the good life. So anything I'm doing for like home improvement or trying to get things repaired, I, I say that's a creator of, a good li uh, of the good life. And I've got those juicy roles for all areas of my life. So when I'm coming up with these things to do, I categorize it with a role. And then, and this is one of the more time consuming things I do in this planning session, is I take all those things that I've dumped into my inbox and got them out of my head. I assign them to a day of the week. And based on how much time I think they're going to take, I said, I could do this on Monday. This one's going to have to wait till Thursday because I have to talk to this person. I went, I just, I assign a day for everything. I used to try to get down to assigning times and that was just, that was overkill. And life has a way of coming in and kind of laughing at, uh, at my plan sometimes. So I don't try to assign times unless, unless it's a meeting and, I, I assign a day. Sometimes I'll see this day looks overloaded. Maybe I can move it back to this day, which isn't as much. And by the end of that, I feel so much, personally, I feel so much more relief because I've got all these things kind of, kind of spread out uh, throughout the week. And I know what I'm doing, at least what I plan to do every day. And of course, life happens, things come up and you got to be flexible. You got to adapt to that. But you've you've got your target. Remember what Zig Ziglar says, you cannot hit a target that you don't even have. And when we're, when we're thinking about consistency being the key, something I, that was what I do on the weekly, uh, on a weekly basis, but I also do something on a daily basis. In fact, I had a recent podcast about this. Uh, if you don't subscribe to my, my podcast, it's called the broadcast storm. Uh, you can go to, uh, well, you can go to kwtrain.com slash podcast, and that'll take you to the, 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 uh, the Apple podcast version of that. But uh, I'm on Spotify as well. You can search for Kevin Wallace, the Broadcast Storm, and uh, and I've got a uh, and it's on Spotify or it's on uh, or it's on uh, iTunes. If you want to go that route, you can use the podcast app. But here's what I do, kind of on a daily basis. First thing is something I don't do, and that is I don't check my mail. I don't check my email the first thing of the day. So many people roll out of bed and the very thing first thing they do, they grab their phone and they go through their email. And it's like, oh, if that person needs this response, I'm going to go have to look. I love what Brendan Burchard says about, about email. He says that email is an incredibly efficient organizing system for other people's agendas. <laughs> Isn't that true? It's an organizing system, not for what's important to you, for other people's agendas. I don't want to be the, I don't want the first hour of my day being me pulled in to what other people have in mind for me to do that day. That time is for me to get get my mind right, get uh, get kind of centered, get get focused on what I'm going to do that day. So I don't check email during the first hour of the day. That's a hard one to do, by the way. Try to do that for five days in a row. And I like to read something positive. Um, for example, let's see. Uh, yeah, here, here's the one that I, I was reading today. It's called it's called Built to Serve. And it's written by Evan Carmichael. I would highly recommend it. I'm not all the way through. I'm about halfway through it right now. But um, it's a great book. It's, uh, it's kind of written for entrepreneurs, but it talks about whatever you struggled with earlier in your life, that is something you can use to, to serve others with. You can make a career out of helping people overcome your early struggles. And I was reading about that, and I thought, you know what? This is directly applying to my career. Because uh, because early on, I, I I had trouble learning a lot of technical stuff. 
it, it did not come easy to me. I, I went into uh, an electrical engineering program because I love technology. It wasn't a fact that I didn't love it. I was passionate about it. I would build up, I would build stuff in my home as a kid. I loved it. But when we got into all the calculus and all the heavy duty math in the electrical engineering program, to be honest, um, at one point in, uh, in the university, I got on academic probation. My grades were so bad. But uh, after kind of refocusing and thinking about my why and, and re-motivating myself and knowing I really want this, a couple of years later, I was on the dean's list because I had improved my grades so dramatically. And you know what it was? I discovered that the way I learn is not necessarily from your traditional textbook. I like to sim I, I love things that are simplified. I actually enjoy reading things that kind of break it down. Now I was taking these advanced electrical engineering courses and I went to my local bookstore. You know what really helped me get going uh, and understand some basic concepts that they just kind of assume you know? Uh, here's a book. I think this was published in 1984. I found it in, in a stack this morning and it's called Electronics the Easy Way. I went out and bought that book uh, like in the mid uh, or I guess in the late 80s when I was when I was in college, and by seeing things explained simply, that really helped me get the basics, and then I could build and build and build and build on that. And I thought, you know, that's really what my career is all about. Because I struggled so much early on, and even in my first job, I didn't do great um, initially. I mean, I worked hard, I studied hard, but I would there were a lot of times I would break some of the equipment I was working on. And uh, I mean, the, the other people that had been there, they started to make fun of me. No kidding. They would, uh, they would print out these really nasty messages on the, like the, the shared printer uh, about me. And I finally had to go have this confrontation with, uh, with one of the, uh, with one of the supervisors that wasn't very pleasant, but uh, yeah, I was, it was, it was not easy to me. And I always had a lot of self doubt about, it. I'm never going to be able to do this. I remember, Telling someone uh, like back in the mid '90s, yeah, oh yeah, I could never earn a CCIE. That was just out of my realm of possibility. But you know what? I developed my ability to figure things. Uh, I started to believe in my ability to figure things out. That's something Brenda Bouchard says all the time. Believe in your ability to figure things out. Everything is figure outable. Somebody said, and if you have that mindset then if you start simply, you can grow on that. So that's what our company is all about. It's about simplifying. So, wow, I got off on a tangent there, didn't I? But uh, that's, what I was, that's what I've been reading lately. So I'll, I'll read something positive. And again, because I am a Christian, I like to have a time of, of, of prayer, devotion, meditation. So that's one of the first things I do of a morning. I did that, re read a, a devotional passage. And uh, some people uh, like to do meditation. I do that as well sometimes. I've got this little app on my watch, the little Breathe app. Sometimes I'll do that for three minutes just to kind of set and, and, and calm down if I get too stressed. Brenda Bouchard uh, recommends that when you do that, because a lot of people, you try to meditate, your mind goes in all kinds of directions. He just repeats the word release, release, release over and over again. I, I do that for like three minutes and just three minutes has incredible results. And do, do some movement. Uh, do some sort of exercise if you can, if if your doctor approves. Uh, yeah, I'm on. I was uh, 50 minutes on a uh, recumbent bike this morning, and I also did like some calisthenics. So I, I exercised for about 55 minutes this morning. So that kind of gets the juices flowing, and I like to watch something. So when I'm on the bike. I was watching a video. Uh, you remember Anthony uh, Sequeira from a couple of days ago? He recently came out with a video on uh, Kubernetes on the Google Cloud platform. So I was watching that. And uh, I like to watch a lot of training videos when I'm, when I'm exercising. And then I look, I get my Things app again, and I look through the things that I've got to do that day. And I think about accomplishing each one of those. And I, I ask my, there are two morning questions that I ask myself. Sometimes it's more. Now, going back to the Brendan Bouchard planner, this whole section right here, this is a series of questions you can ask yourself. And if I've got time, I'll, I'll go through all of those. But at minimum, I ask myself two questions a day. Uh, and those are, what can, I be, what can I be excited today is the first one. And for today, I thought, you know what? I'm really excited that the CERT Summit has been so success, uh, successful. We've had tons of students show up. We've got great feedback. I feel that I've been able, and Charles and uh, Anthony, uh, that we've collectively been able to add value to you. 
at least provide a um, a productive distraction from all the all the news out there because you know prior it helped me tremendously as well because prior to this I was um, I was watching like news. I was watching the Good Morning America thing every morning about all the deaths that have happened, and it was it would get to me. But you know what? I've been so busy putting all the material together for the CERT Summit, I haven't had time. I haven't watched it for the last three days, and I don't miss it, honestly. So that's my first morning question. The second morning question I ask myself is, okay, uh, well, let's think through some, uh, what might be a challenge that will come up today. Have you ever worried about something that's going to come up today? You know the uh, my secret for dealing with that? It's decide in advance how you're going to react. So I thought about, okay, what what's a challenging thing that might come up today? Might not. But um, I'm going to have a Zoom call later on, and uh, there might be some questions that come up that uh, that I wouldn't know the answer to immediately, and that would make me uncomfortable. So what I did earlier, I took some time and thought, okay, I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about this, and talk about this. And uh, so I decided in advance how I'm going to respond to that situation. So that is an overview of how I set I set my goals and kind of kind of run through the day. And the next thing we want to jump into when it comes to your career is getting that dream job. And to get the dream job, the traditional approach is, yeah, you're going to go out and you're going to send out a bunch of resumes or do it online. You're going to go into interviews. Well, let's talk about how can you find open jobs? How can you construct an IT resume? How do you do good in an IT interview? And this is probably going to vary by country. I, I'm just familiar with what we have here in the, uh, in the United States. But... Some of the big job boards here in the United States where you can get online and look for IT jobs, you can search for keywords like CCIE. Uh, you can go to uh, Indeed.com, Monster, Dice. I used to be a big fan of Dice. If I were doing a big job search today, I would be spending a lot of time on Indeed. They, they seem to be really, really good. So I might recommend you check out Indeed.com. And something that's often not thought of as a job search tool, but it's a great one, is LinkedIn. Uh, this is a picture. I was out at LinkedIn uh, last year shooting a course, and I think I'm going to be going back out in August to shoot another course out there. Really amazing facility, but that besides just being a social network for business people, it's a great job search site. In fact, I want to give you a little. Uh, I want to give you a little demonstration of that. Let me go over to. Let's go over to LinkedIn for just a second, and let's say that I wanted to get a job uh, with uh, with Cisco as an example. What I could do is if you built up several contacts, you might be able to reach out to people that are your contacts and send them an in-mail, they call it in LinkedIn, and just say, hey, I've, I'm, I'm looking, I'm open to changing careers. What kind of opportunities do you have there? Or maybe you know they have an opportunity and you can ask them if you know they can put a word in for you and you the principle of reciprocity, see if you can do something for them as well. But just as an example, I could... Uh, I could go under I could go under jobs and I could say let's go under people and I might want to search for people that work for certain companies and I can say uh, who do uh, I want to search for people that work for Cisco and if I'm already connected to them then it's going to show up as I can message them right now directly and yeah I'm connected with lots and lots of people from Cisco obviously or there might be a button that says connect where maybe you could connect with someone that works at Cisco but Cisco has places all over the world. Uh, the uh, the closest main site to where I live is uh, RTP, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. So I can select locations and say, yeah, the Raleigh-Durham, that's, that's the RTP location. I can apply that and say, okay, what kind of connections do I have that work there? And that's a way for me to get like one-on-one -on -one conversations with somebody outside of the traditional send resume, get invited to an interview. B uh, but that's just making person-to-person -person contact. Something else we can do if we go into the jobs there, and by the way, I'm a premium LinkedIn subscriber. You get some extra features if you do that. So you probably won't be able to do all this that I'm showing you, some of it, but uh, not all this if you don't have a, uh, a premium subscription. But let's say that I want to search for a job and let's say I want to be uh, a network engineer. I'll say network, network engineer, and I'll put in my zip code. And it comes back and it gives me a list of companies, 
uh, and I uh, and this was within 25 miles of my zip code. I could expand that if I wanted to, but within 25 miles, I've got all these openings. And uh, oh, Eastern Kentucky University has an opening for. That almost sounds like my old job because I was a network manager at Eastern Kentucky University. And I think one of the cool things, if you get one that's already had several applica applicants, let me find one here. Let's see, there's not many for this one. Let me do a different search. Let's say, uh, let me change it to Lexington, Kentucky. That's a little bit of a bigger market. And let's, I'm looking for some that has lots of applicants. How about um, network, network Architect? Nope, still not there. Hmm, what would be a good one to search for? Network Administrator? Let's try that. I just want to show you a feature that wasn't showing up there. This one might do it. We've got seven applicants for this. Yeah, if you've got seven applicants, uh, oh, it says we're waiting on more data. Still not enough. Okay, I'll, I'll just have to tell you what it, what it says. Uh, after they have a certain number of appli applicants, it actually takes a look at your LinkedIn profile and it, uh, it gives you a rating, like uh, on a scale of one through uh, zero to 100, of how you compare, uh, how do your credentials compare with everybody else that applied. So it helps you get a sense right off the bat, how strong is your competition? I think that is kind of cool. If you're if you're wanting to know what is a salary for a particular career, let's uh, let's go back to jobs, and we can go under this salary area. And for a salary, I'll say here I'll say network engineer for the United States. So in the United States as a whole, it looks like a network engineer makes about seventy eight thousand dollars. And it tells you the average salaries or the salary range for different areas. Like uh, here's the uh, the Research Triangle Park. Uh, they don't make as much there for some reason. That's interesting. They make a lot in the San Francisco area, over a hundred thousand. I wonder if a network architect. How much do they make? Oh yeah. If you get uh, if you're a network architect, you're more of a network designer. Uh, yeah. Average nationwide, hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year. How about that? And uh, yeah, higher if uh, depending on where you live. Yeah, in the San Francisco area, it's over one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year. I won't, I won't spend any more time on that. But it's a great tool for searching out people that you can contact directly. It's a great tool for looking for jobs in certain geographical areas. And just researching the salary, is it even going to be worth going after a job? What, what, what would be a reasonable number for me to ask for in my negotiations with them? So don't overlook LinkedIn. Now, let's talk resume. I have seen a ton of resumes come, come across my desk when I was in a management position. And there were so many times I just thought, oh, this, wow, what are they thinking here? So let me, uh, let me give you some, and again, this is my perspective of what some tips are for writing a, a good IT resume. Number one, be brief. Don't turn in a three-page resume. And I used to be guilty of this. Uh, I thought the, the bigger the better. I'm gonna look more experienced uh, if I have a big long resume so everything I could think of, like I was in the Boy Scouts or something like that, I would put that on there. Uh, I don't think I actually put that on there, but I, I would put way too much information on there. You want to be brief because these people are going through a lot of resumes. They're not going to spend half an hour reading your very lengthy resume and focus on results. One of the mistakes people make is they say, well, I attended this seminar or I, uh, I worked for this company for five years. And they say, okay, I've, I've done this or I've experienced this. Focus on results. For example, I led a team of five network engineers on a project where we deployed a, um, an MPLS network. Give a specific result. You led this many people, you worked with this kind of equipment, it took this long, it produced this kind of return on investment for the company. Give very specific results. And omit your objectives. Uh, a lot of people say, okay, uh, they started out with saying, my objective is to, uh, is to and normally it's always to work for that company. That's your real, that's your really uh, their objective. But they'll say something like, "I want to use my skills to better my uh, my employer's bottom line" or something like that. 
in general, employers don't care that much about your objective. They're wanting a, they're wanting you to come in and they want you to be a good fit so that you can contribute to their business success. And most of those are not, a lot of them I'll say, are not very sincere. I would just completely omit the objective altogether. And, and something else um, I would recommend is have zero tolerance for typos. Nothing raises red flags like having typographical errors on your resume because this is your first impression to this potential employer and they already see that you're not careful enough to proofread your resume. So reread it over and over. Have somebody else read it. Have zero tolerance for typos and highlight your top certifications. Again, this is something I used to be guilty of. If I had a certification in anything, it got listed. But let's say that you've got your Network Plus You've got your A plus certification. You've got your N A N P I E. Don't if you've got your CCIE, just say you've got a CCIE. Here's your number. Here's the field that it's in. You don't need to put that you have the CompTIA A plus certification. Put your put the big ones there. If you've got one or two top certifications, list those there. They don't care about the lower ones if they see that you're a CCIE. So just list your top certifications. Let's talk about interview tips. If you have a good resume, you've applied to the right place, you go into the interview, let me give you three tips. And the first one is establish rapport. You want to establish a good relationship with the person you're interviewing with. And going back to some, uh, some Tony Robbins advice, uh, Tony Robbins would talk about uh, matching and mirroring. Uh, he makes the comment that uh, uh, people like people that are like them. And he was suggesting that when you're talking with somebody to build that rapport, then if they talk in a rapid pace, you talk in a rapid pace. If they're more slow in their conversation, you be more slow in your conversation. If they make certain gestures subtly, you don't want to look like you're mirroring every single thing. But you know, if they lean back, you're going to lean back. If they cross their legs. Eventually, you uh, you, just, you get the idea. You're going to kind of do what they do not making it super obvious. I don't know that anybody has ever noticed when I'm doing that. In fact, I, I've, I practice doing it so much, I find myself doing it involuntarily. If I'm around an area in Kentucky which tends to speak a little more Kentuckian, my accent slips, I've noticed. I'll start to go into to more of a traditional Kentucky accent. Or when I'm, when I'm traveling with somebody else, I'm I have a totally different accent. It's not because I'm trying to be res disrespectful or anything. It's just, I, I'm just automatically anymore match and mirror the people that I'm around. Here's a true story. I was going for, I was going for a job with, uh, it was one of the big, uh, one of the big five uh, accounting firms and I was going to be in the IT department and I went in for the interview and on the way to the interview, I was driving and I was listening to that, uh, that Tony Robbins uh, cassette tape back in those days on building rapport. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And the guy that interviewed me, he had very exaggerated mannerisms. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. He would make a statement and he would violently nod his, he uh, his head up and down. He would say, yeah, we're implementing this next week. Literally, he would shake his head like that. I thought, oh boy, <laughs> I, 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 want, I, want to, I want to establish rapport with him. So I would, I would do the same thing. Yeah, I had experience doing this. And I would nod my head like that. And there might've been one or two other things that I matched or mirrored, but uh, that was an extreme example, but I, I stuck to my guns and uh, you know what? They offered me the job. Now we didn't agree on salary, uh, so I didn't take the job, but they called me back about a week or two later uh, and they said, okay, we know that we couldn't agree on price, but can you recommend somebody because we want somebody that is like you? That was their words. I don't think it was because I didn't even have a CCA at this point. I don't think it was because of my credentials. I think that it was because of that rapport that I established. So I would recommend you practice before you go into an interview with other people. But uh, there's power in that. There really is. And also, be ready to be vulnerable and open and share a story of regret. Uh, one of the most common interview questions you get is, all right, tell us about like one of the worst things you did or, or tell us about a bad decision you made. Uh, or even if they don't, maybe you can work this in because it shows that uh, you're not super defensive. So many people, if, um, if, they're, you're, 
if they push you on some failure you had, a lot of people will just get really defensive and say, it's, it's their fault, it's their fault. They'll start blaming other people. But if you can take ownership, that says a lot. Uh, here's a personal example. When I was um, in some interview, I was asked about a mistake I had made in my job. And it was when I was a network manager at a university. And I, and I told them a story of one time where I, uh, I, I knew that you were supposed to, to praise in public and coach in private. In other words, you don't reprimand. You don't give instruction or negative feedback to an employee in front of other people. But when you want to give them praise, you do that in front of other people. And there was one time, and I still regret it, um, I was mad. This guy didn't do what I told him to do, and it was starting to be a pattern. And I kind of let him have it in front of his fellow workers. He just immediately head down, went, did the job. I felt horrible. So I went, I talked to him, apologized. I've never done anything like that since then. Uh, but by sharing that story of regret and telling them that I learned from that and I've never done it since then, that showed that, yes, I do make mistakes. I'm not going to be super defensive and I'm going to learn from those, those mistakes. So think in your past of a time where you have that, that story of regret and your redemption that you can share. And finally, you're going to be asked all kinds of questions that may be, uh, may be technical questions that you haven't worked with that technology. They ask you something about MPLS and you've never worked with MPLS. Uh, be ready to do what's called a bridge. Take what they say and bridge it over to something else that you have done. For example, when I was being interviewed down at Disney World, uh, they asked me a question about... Um, Oh, I don't remember the exact question, but it was something like uh, something about the, their network backbone routing. And I had not worked with the specific technology they were talking about. So I addressed that. I said, okay, so you're using that to do this function? Well, that's kind of like when I worked at the university, we had uh, we were doing multi-homing BGP, and I, I talked about you know how we did how we did some of the uh, the autonomous system path prepending uh, so that uh, the most attractive link would be the uh, the faster link. And so I took what they said, kind of generalized it, and then told a specific story of where I had done where I had excelled in sort of a in sort of a neighboring a neighboring technology. So I had this really powerful story to tell that was slightly different than what they asked. So be ready with some success stories that you can be ready to bridge to if they ask you a question like that. Those are some of my best tips for, for landing that dream job. And one of the things when it comes to, to getting that dream job is they look at your resume, you've got this certification, you've graduated with honors. What have you done? Do you have experience? That That is so tough to get real life experience. And uh, there are a few ways to get that experience. Let's talk about some of those. One way is to volunteer. I mean, who's going to turn you down for a volunteering job? If you go to, uh, for example, uh, I volunteer to take care of the, uh, of the Wi-Fi network at, uh, at my local church. Or you might go to a charitable organization that you, uh, that you care about. And you can just volunteer to be their network admin. Oh, you want you need another Wi-Fi access point set up? I can do that for you. Or uh, you can start building a resume of these projects that you've done for these places that you volunteered for. Suddenly, without getting a job, suddenly you have experience. Another way to get experience is to start your own IT consulting company. Now, you might do that while you still have your full-time job, or you might want to make it your full-time job for a while. Uh, personal example, uh, you could do it while you have a job. This is a picture of me from, uh, well, what? this is like 1994, uh, 95 maybe. Uh, this is when I first started a business creating IT training videos. I've been doing this for a while. My first training videos were on Let's see, MS-DOS, Microsoft Windows 3.1, and WordPerfect version 5 or 6. I don't even remember. 
that, that was my first tra uh, that was my first video training projects and you might be able to see in the background they're on VHS cassette tapes <laughs> that's how I had to distribute them this is like 25 years ago and I'm at some little trade show and I've got this really pathetic booth set up and oh, can you see I'm selling the video for $39 but I've got this big incentive it says free fonts <laughs> remember back in the day where you used to have to pay for fonts I was like I'll give you this disc with all these fonts on it if you buy my training uh, that was not a successful business by the way but it was something I could add to my resume yeah I was the CEO of Bitwise Network uh, uh, Bitwise Networking where we did training and I also went into people's homes and I installed some of their stuff or, or in businesses install install their stuff so even though the business did not uh, really turn a profit it was experience that you could then put on your resume or you might want to do it full time I mean if it uh, you you could literally or many people could literally do very well much better than your full-time job by doing something like IT consulting uh, or being an integrator full-time here's the big danger though a lot of, and I see this in all industries not just IT for example people think that uh, okay I'm a good carpenter I'm going to open a carpentry business or I'm good at working on cars I'm going to open a, a mechanic shop or in our case you might say I'm good at IT so I'm going to open up an IT business so many people don't realize that your skill set is only going to play a small fraction of the overall business there are business skills that you need to bring as well if they don't come from you you need to bring somebody else in that has those skills that's why an incredibly number uh, high number high percentage of businesses fail i've heard different statistics there everything from 50 percent to 90 percent but uh after you get uh, after you get past five years uh, most companies don't make it that long so you need to have some business uh, that goes along with your skill set. And I'm not trying to teach uh, an MBA course here for you. I just want you to be aware of some of these things to think about. You need to legally form your business. And I'll talk about each one of these bullets, by the way. You think, uh, how do you get customers? Just because you, you hang a shingle out and say, I'm going to, I'll come install your Wi-Fi network. That's no guarantee that anybody's going to come. How do you get customers? How do you manage all the projects? There's a lot of balls in the air when you're running your own company. And how do you, uh, how do you just do your day-to-day -day operation? Well, let's talk. And first of all, here's my legal disclaimer. I am not a lawyer. I know very little about law. Uh, but this is my understanding of the way corporations work or business entities work in the United States. It's different in different countries. And don't take legal advice from me. This is just my understanding, and this is what I make my decisions based on. But I started out as a in a sole proprietorship. That's where I was doing business with a, just an alias. You can do a DBA, a doing business as, or you can uh, just run it in your own name, like Kevin Wallace Training, for example, in your own name. Uh, the downside to that is you're liable. If somebody sues you, they can come after your personal assets. And a partnership is basically like a sole proprietorship. It's just more than one person and they're liable so finally i got uh, uh when i decided to do it full time that's when i became an llc which gives you some uh, it gives you some protection and there's no separate tax return it just kind of flows through to your own personal tax return or you might become a corporation an s corporation very similar to llc's in fact when we started hiring employees that's when we became uh and uh, we file as an s corp right now and that gives us some tax advantages because we're now paying out salaries and we've got retirement programs and you know health benefits and all that stuff so there's a lot uh, a lot going on there uh, now i haven't moved to a c corporation yet that's where the c corporation is its own entity it has its own tax return you got a board of directors you got to meet all kinds of things but currently we're kind of operating as an llc filing as a uh, filing as a as a as a c uh, s corp right now but uh, you need to decide how is your business going to operate and how do you get customers? You could certainly get word of mouth. That's the uh, probably the most inexpensive way. If you're if you're working locally, it's not an online business. And even if it is an online business, word of mouth. I love the fact that Facebook ads let you do incredible targeting. When I was advertising and trying to uh, let everybody know about this uh, three day cert summit, I did Facebook advertising where I targeted people that had an interest in Cisco certifications and several other different interests. And that's the reason it showed up on your Instagram uh, feed and your Facebook news feed, for example. We can do very precise targeting. 
you can start attracting customers. I was talking with uh, with a friend just the other day about this, and I was recommending that, yeah, a way for you to start building recognition is to put out YouTube videos. You can do that for free, and you can pro- you can do some education and let them know about what you offer. It's almost like you're, uh, oh yeah, and if you monetize the videos, you can get you can get paid to do advertising for your company. That blows me away. I mean, I love YouTube. I'm trying to put out about a video a week this year. That's one of my goals. So that, uh, yeah, I, it'll be my brand will be more recognized. And they send me a check for hundreds of dollars every month because they run ads on those videos. I'm getting paid to do advertising. You cannot beat that. And I certainly post on different social media to let people know about what's coming up, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. And one of the ways that uh, you can kind of get a new customer from an interest to actually making a purchase is to take them through what's uh, oftentimes referred to as a funnel. Uh, For example, you might give them a free piece of content. If you're going to be an IT uh, consultant, you might have this PDF report on three things to know when you install your Wi-Fi network or three things that will give you better Wi-Fi coverage or three things to know before you pick uh, you pick your internet service provider and you give that away if they'll give you your uh, give you their email and they say hey uh, and you say hey thanks for your email uh, I want to send you like this uh, this uh, series of free training over the next several days so once they opt in, then you send them a training video and another training video and a few days later, another training video. And by this time, they're, they're hopefully building some trust in you and they're seeing if, you, if they would like to work with you or not. And then you make your offer. And honestly, that's kind of what, uh, that's what we do with our CCNA product. You can go out and sign up for a CCNA mini course that we have. You go to kwtrain.com slash CCNA hyphen mini and it's this funnel. You give us you give us your user or give us your email address, and over a series of days, I send you a training video. Uh, I send you another training video and another training video. And by that time, you know if if you like my training style or not. If you do, then I send you out another video and say, "Hey, did you like that? Then you'll love this." If you go in and get the CCNA program. You might hear this referred to as a sideways sales letter because have you ever seen those sales letters you get that are like uh, uh, 12 screens long that you have to read through or sometimes not read through? Uh, Yeah, this is like taking that letter and just kind of breaking it up into chunks. Or you might hear it called an OVO funnel, which stands for opt-in value offer. But those are some thoughts on on getting... uh, on, on getting customers. And when you're doing your customer communication, I just wrote down here some uh, some software that you might want to consider to do your email. Uh, because if you're sending out, uh, right, when I send out an email, it's to a lot of people. It's over, I think it's right now, maybe over 10, uh, no, it's, it's over 30,000 people that we email to at once right now. And you cannot do that just with your regular Gmail account. You've got to have some sort of email provider that will do that. And I've listed a few. And, uh, there are different companies that will help you create your funnel. I do my podcast through Libsyn. Uh, you can start with them, I think, for seven bucks uh, to, to do a podcast. And you need your website where you're going to be hosting your, your content and have your membership area. And you've got all these, pro- like right now, we're working on lots of projects. We're doing stuff with LinkedIn. I'm doing stuff with Todd Lamley. I'm doing stuff with uh, David Bomble. We're creating a Narcy right now. We've got our IT Insider. Pro- wow, I'm overwhelming myself as I'm talking about this. we got a lot of projects going on. How do we keep all that straight? And uh, uh, we've got uh, three people, uh, just to be totally transparent, we've got three employees, myself, uh, my wife, which takes care of a lot of the, the back office stuff. I mean, she does the payroll, takes care of insurance, that kind of stuff that I just have zero desire to fool with. And then uh, then Charles, which does a whole lot. He, there's a lot on his plate where he's doing uh, training. And I'll, I'll point out some of the things that he's doing as we go through this. But for project management, two recommendations. I know they work well. Uh, Basecamp, a little more expensive, very popular. And what we use, which is Asana. And we have like the entry level and that doesn't cost much of anything. And it does everything we need to do. Big fan of Asana. Now, when you operate your business, uh, let's think about customer service. How are you going to respond to that? Well, Charles is in charge of our customer service. And if you send, if you make a comment on our LinkedIn page, it's probably going to be Charles that, uh, that responds to you. If you send an email to support at kw.com, that's probably going to be Charles that's, uh, that responds to you. For accounting, I used to try to do it myself. Uh, but uh, since then, oh, 
Uh, since then, we've uh, we've got a CPA that does the accounting because the taxis just got way too complicated. So I've got somebody that we uh, that we pay monthly to look over our QuickBooks and uh, somebody that we pay to do our, our taxis. And there are so many opportunities to make mistakes uh, when you're running a business. I think you need an outside perspective from time to time. So all three of us in our company, uh, we get together right now. We do it on a quarterly basics, uh, basis. We've got a strategic planner that we work with. Uh, we go over to his house and we spend half a day or in some cases a full day or two days, uh, depending on what kind of review it is. And we strategically plan out what we're doing, what projects are important, what we need to add on, what we need to take off, who do we need to shift responsibilities. Just getting that extra perspective and not just trying to come up with ideas on the fly, and it's incredibly valuable. And we bring in a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but we bring in some contract workers. Like, for example, Anthony's not an employee, but he does a lot of stuff for us. Michael Shannon's not an employee, but he does training for us. And if you don't have those kind of contacts like I had the blessing of having, then you can go to Upwork.com. Uh, in fact, right now, we've got somebody from uh, that I think Charles found on Upwork.com that does a lot of our video editing for us. Now, I, I certainly go through and proof everything to make sure that, and Charles does as well, to make sure that it's, it's good and we correct any things that are wrong. But that takes hours and hours away from us just by outsourcing what we can outsource. Think about, think about what you could outsource. And some recommendations for accounting, QuickBooks. I know, I know the the, the diehard accountants. They uh, they don't think it's robust enough. It's all I need. And finally, let's talk about some time management strategies, shall we? Time management is so. There are so many books on time management, and there's a lot of overlapping uh, advice. There's a lot of conflicting advice. Here's my recommendation to you because I've kind of I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to all the time management, the organization. I've tried so many different planners. I recommend that you become a mad scientist. And what I mean by that is experiment. Try this, try that. Find out what works best for you. What works best for me very well may not work work best for you at all. But I want to share some of the some of the big some of the big names out there. And one of them is uh, Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. Deep Work is going to, uh, is all about having times of focus, deep times of focus where you can concentrate on something. In fact, here's, uh, I, I made some bullet points. It's a big book. I've got it on Kindle, uh, but it's a big book. Just to summarize some of it, uh, Cal Newport says that deep work, it's a professional activity, so it's something you're doing for your job, that you do in a distraction-free environment. Because I, I know now with all the work-from-home people right now, they're finding out that, uh, yeah, if you've got kids running around or if you've got uh, if you've got Netflix running in the next room, there's a lot of distractions uh, working from home. You want to be in a distraction-free environment. And he says, he uses big words like cognitive, uh, but he says it pu pushes your cognitive abilities. In other words, you got to do some hard thinking. You got to think hard, and uh, if you do that, the result you'll get is you're going to be able to create value that nobody else is creating for your customer. You're going to improve your own skills, and it's going to be hard for your competition to replicate what you did. If you'll have these periods of deep work, uh, in fact, just to get scientific a little bit. Uh, studies have shown that if you do this deep work and you're just in total concentration on something, you're thinking deeply for an hour, there's actually this substance called myelin that forms over your your brain uh, your brain neurons and that helps them talk easier with one another. It actually improves your thinking to have these periods of deep work. But how do we do it? And Obviously, there's a big, thick book that tells you how you do it, but I'm going to summarize it with an acronym uh, of, of DEEP to help you memorize it. Number one, have a dedicated workspace. I mean, I have a place uh, in my home right now. I'm in my home studio right now, and uh, yeah, it's I can I can seal it off, and I can just stay in here. Now, if I've got an office upstairs, and there, yeah, if the kids are coming by, or uh, it's just easy to get distracted with somebody popping in. But if I need a distraction-free environment, this is it. And when you start, for me, I need to know when is this going to be over. I need an end time. Otherwise, I'm going to be kind of stressed out about uh, thinking, oh, I'm going to need to take a break. But if I know, I'm going to go for an hour, and I'll take a break. I'll go for an hour, and I'll take a break. Know an exact end time when you're going to 
going to stop for a while. And instead of just saying, yeah, I'm going to do that, you want to have an easy starting sequence and a way to do that is through scheduling. Uh, you don't just wake up one morning, or you might, and say, I'm going to do some deep work today. Uh, I like to... Uh, I like to schedule when those deep work periods are going to be. Now, people that are really into this hardcore, it's kind of like a, a sine wave. If you look at their calendar, they're going to do deep work for an hour, they'll pause. They'll do deep work for an hour and pause. Uh, the people that are the best at this, they can squeeze out about four hours of deep work a day. That's like the ultimate. If you can get four hours in. People that are, and I, I'm not there. Don't, I'm not there. I'm a beginner at this at, le at, at most. But... The people that are just kind of getting started, it's a little bit of a struggle for them to get in an hour of deep work. I'll tell you a time when I use this personally. I was trying to, um, I was developing my uh, Fundamentals of Network program Programmability course, and I was trying to write this Python script to go out and do something with a Cisco, uh, a Cisco SDN controller. And I don't even remember what it was at the time, but I needed to get this working because I wanted to teach it in my class. And I'd, I would try a little bit here and try a little bit. It just didn't make sense. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to try this deep work thing. And I told my family, all right, I'm going to put my phone on do not disturb or maybe just turn it off. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to work for an hour solid with no distractions. Maybe I put it on some, uh, some easy listening music in the background, just some instrumental music. And I did. I went... I focused I, like a laser beam. I was focused for an hour. <sighs> I took a break for maybe five, 10 minutes and I went back for another hour. Still didn't have it. Took another break. Went back for another hour. Still didn't have it. Took a break. Went back for 20 minutes and I finally completely figured it out. So I spent about three hours and 20 minutes of doing deep work that day and I figured something out that I had been toying with for maybe a week so deep work can be incredibly valuable. Something. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Oh, I forgot the last one. Uh, the P in deep work is power ups. You know, for a lot of people, it becomes exhausting. You get that after lunch uh, slump sometimes around two o'clock. For some people, it's getting a cup of coffee. Some people would argue that that's not healthy, but uh, I like to have a cup of coffee in the morning. And for some people, that's it. Something else that I've tried that Brendan Bouchard recommends is when you're taking those breaks, you work hard for a period of time and you take your break, go walk around outside if you can, if it's, if it's decent weather. I mean, just sometimes I'll just go out. Maybe I'll walk up and down my driveway uh, a few times. And, uh, and that kind of breaks out, breaks the cobwebs out. And another one of the really popular time management books out there is called uh, Getting Things Done. In fact, you'll see a lot of applications that are a lot of apps for your phone or your computer that say that they work with GTD. That means getting things done. That's a David Allen's approach. Now, this is a lot more complicated. And for me, I've used elements of it, but I've never really gone all in on it because there's a lot of moving parts. But some people just, they swear by it. Uh, you can go to day-long seminars just on how to use the getting things done process. So what I've done, I've tried to simplify it as much as I can for you while still giving you the sense for what it's like. You might, again, be a mad scientist, experiment, play with this a little bit. But remember, uh, oh yeah, I love his quote. He says, the mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. If, you if you're trying to remember too many things in your mind, then they just get cluttered and you get overwhelmed and you start, I, I, I shouldn't say you, I start looping with things. I don't want to do that. So he's all about getting things as quickly as possible out of your mind into some area where you can capture that idea. You want, In fact, I'm going to give you an acronym to help you remember the basic steps here. It's CPR. Those steps are capture, process, and review. Now, capture is when uh, you have an idea, like I, I mentioned that, uh, that I had an idea for something I wanted to, to include in this class, and I, I, I broke away from my shower, and I went and wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, or a lot of times, I'll be in the car, and I'll think of something, and I'll just use Siri, and I'll say, uh, I'll say something like, well, there's an actual Siri automation that lets me put something directly into my Things app, and sometimes I'll just talk to Siri and, and add some things. Or some people want to write them down. Or the big time I capture is on that uh, that weekly planning period on Sunday afternoon where I'm just thinking about all the things I got to do that week. Capture, capture. I'm just writing all those things down. And it's overwhelming until I kind of process them and decide when am I going to do them. 
now process that's where the that's where it gets a little bit complex in my opinion with the getting things done method when you're processing things i, I try I, I created this this morning for you i created sort of a uh, sort of a flow chart so you've got one of these things to do that's a ttd you've got one of these things that you've captured it's on your capture list now you're going to go through this processing and i would do this probably on sunday afternoon well you're going to ask yourself, is this something that needs to be done now? Now, when I say now, I don't mean stop what you're doing and go do it right now. But is it something that I need to take action on fairly soon? Or is it something that would be good to do someday? If the answer is no, it could wait. Then you have an organ in your organization system, you have a someday folder. No kidding. This things app, it comes with, a, a, it's called a someday folder. And if I have something that I want to do, but yeah, not really on the radar right now that I need to take care of soon, I'll just put it in the someday folder and I'll go back and look at that occasionally. Oh yeah, maybe I should re revisit that. But if it is something that needs to be addressed, you've got some sort of a commitment, uh, then uh, you need to think, all right, if I want to do this, what's my next action? What's the next step I can take towards getting this done? And you don't just think about my next step is uh, go buy this thing from Amazon no, what's your eventual outcome? You know, you need to know what you're working towards. And once you know your next action, you ask yourself, can this next action be done in two minutes or less? And if the answer is yes, then guess what? You're going to do it right then. But if the answer is no, that's where things get really, uh, and I, I super simplified this one because in his book, uh, there's a lot that happens where you're going to we're going to process your commitments. If it's a big thing, if your outcome is big and it's going to require lots of moving parts, then turn it into a project. Yeah, uh, the Things app that I use, it's got a place for projects where I can, they're not the things to do that show up every day, but it's projects that I'm working through. Or if it's something, yeah, it's going to take more than two minutes. It might take four hours. That's where you schedule it. That's where you put it on your calendar. Or... If you've got some things that need to be done throughout the week, uh, some things need to be done at your home, some things need to be done when you're, maybe you're making phone calls, some things need to be done at your office, David Allen refers to those different places as contexts. And uh, you can say, uh, you can mark it uh, with a, a context tag. And yeah, and the Things app, I'm a big uh, big fan of the Things app, you can tell. the You can have a context tag that says, I'm going to do this when I'm at home. I'm going to do this when I'm making phone calls. And then if you find yourself at home or you find yourself at the office or whatever your context is, or if you're in the car and you can make some phone calls, not legal in all states as I understand it, uh, but if you can make phone calls and if you feel safe doing so, um, you can say, let's do the things in this context. Let's do the things I can do while I'm at the office. So that's kind of an overview of how the processing works with getting things done. And then finally, the review process is, this is kind of like my Sunday afternoon thing where I'm thinking about the future. This is where you think, where do I want to be in three to five years? Uh, kind of kind of like uh, we did that exercise earlier, didn't we? Where do I want to be in three to five years? Maybe in my career, maybe in my personal life. And you look at all these things that you've captured. Some things obviously will contribute to, to the future you that you'd like to be. Some things might be nice to do, but it doesn't. It's not really in alignment with what you're really going for. I love what John Maxwell says. He's uh, he's one of the leading uh, leadership uh, authors in the world today. John Maxwell says that you've got to say no to the good so that you can say yes to the best. There's a lot of good opportunities out there that you're going to have to say no to. Because if you're saying yes to those, then you're saying no to something else. You've only got so much time. So I'm, that's something that I'm working on. I'm getting better at saying no to the good so I can say yes to the best. That's kind of an overview of the getting things done process. Let me tell you what I do. I kind of take different sources and I've been a mad scientist and this is what I do in general. And I broke it down into three simple steps. My three-step process, and we've talked about a lot of this, is this. I do my weekly check-in. If I'm really on my game, I will uh, I will go to this weekly learning review, and it's going to talk about uh, it. It gives you some writing prompts about things that you learned this week. For example, the main struggle I faced this past week was, and if I were advising someone dealing with that, here's how I would advise them: 
it kind of puts your yourself in the mentor seat. How would you coach someone else through the issue that you're facing? It gives you a great time of reflection. And we already talked about how you're going to score yourself on different things. And here you're going to rate yourself on some of your habits. And it gives you some good feedback, not to make you feel bad, but to give you maybe a slight course correction so that you can make some incremental improvements in the next week. And as part of that as part of that whole review process, that's where I do that brain dump and I capture everything in my things inbox and I go through and categorize and remember dad of destiny or I've got uh, creator of the good life or if I'm doing like business stuff for the company, I'm the company captain. Uh, so I categorize things, I give them a role and then I start scheduling them. I plug them into different days of the week. That takes a lot of stress off me if I know that there's a plan for getting the, these things done and then daily, I go through that morning ritual that we talked about earlier. And uh, I think it was maybe two podcast episodes back. I think it came out I think it came out May the uh, March the 15th. Uh, it's called my 7-step uh, morning ritual. You might want to go listen to that one. Mm-hmm.